Uh, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I suppose if this is a quorum. Here's the problem set, next problem set uh, that you next Tuesday. Um, so at this point, it's probably worth pausing for just a second and um, discussing where we are uh, in the course and where we are in the uh, development of the subject of general relativity. So the last two weeks um, uh, have been uh, a lot of math that you've uh, encountered pretty fast and, and furiously. Uh, I guess that's the adverb. Um, pretty fast, quickly, fastly? Qu quickly and furiously. Um, and uh, this week, uh, for the next lecture and a half or so, uh, we'll c continue our discussion of uh, the mathematics of curved space times and the mathematics of differential geometry. Um, but by the end of this week, we'll be done with all of the math for this course, uh, essentially. Uh, almost, but that's almost, but not entirely a true statement. Uh, so um, if you've been finding that the last two weeks have been a bit formal or a bit technical for your tastes, uh, don't lose heart because we've only got about uh, two lectures of math left uh, before we dive uh, whole hog into the subject of general relativity. Uh, and into physics, which is the real uh, reason why we're all here. Um, so um, the last uh, two weeks or so, we first spent um, about a week discussing the generalities of manifolds, of tensor calculus, of uh, how we write down equations of physics that are unchanged under coordinate transformation. Uh, before diving into the details of tensor calculus, um, derivatives, uh, both exterior derivatives of differential forms, as well as covariant derivatives of tensors. And um, now what we will do is spend this week discussing um, the final aspect of differential geometry that I want to uh, cover in the beginning of this class, uh, which is the notion of curvature. So um, what is curvature? Well, I told you that um, if we have a metric uh, then we have a notion of geometry. Uh, in particular, if we have a metric, we know how to measure the distance between two points. And so because of that, we should, given a metric, be able to formulate precisely uh, some notion of what it means for space-time to be curved. I've told you that in general relativity, uh, the mechanism that we use to describe gravity is the curvature of space-time. And so now I would like to tell you precisely what it is I mean when I say that space-time is curved. Uh, before I do so, let me just remind you of a few things that we encountered last class. So um, in particular, uh, given a metric, g mu nu, um, on space-time, uh, we learned last class how we were supposed to take derivatives in a uh, covariant manner. Namely, we learned how to take a derivative of a tensor uh, to get another tensor. So let me remind you how that works. So we learned how to take derivatives in a covariant manner. Uh, one starts by defining the uh, Christoffel symbol, which was one half uh, the inverse metric times the sum of three first derivatives of the metric. Uh, this quantity was not a tensor. It transformed under coordinate transformations by picking up a funny um, term involving the second derivative of the uh, coordinate transformation functions, x mu is a function of x mu prime, if you're going from the x mu to x mu prime coordinate system. But this anomalous term under the uh, transformation of coordinates was precisely what we needed in order to define a covariant derivative. So for example, if you have a vector, then if you just write down the set of 16 partial derivatives of the components of that vector, then those partial derivatives don't transform as a tensor under coordinate transformations. Namely, in addition to the usual uh, 
terms involving the Jacobian matrices multiplying um, the components of this object. We also have a funny anomalous term involving the second derivatives of the coordinate transformation, which can be removed if you consider the following correction term, which involves the um, uh, Christoffel symbol multiplied by the vector. And this, we saw, was essentially the only reasonable definition of the derivative of a vector that we could define in a coordinate invariant manner. Um, and uh, this uh, derivative obeys many, but not all, of the usual properties uh, that we usually associate with derivatives. It obeys the product rule or Leibniz rule, as well as uh, being linear. And we went on to define um, derivatives of more complicated tensors. So, for example, if you want to take the derivative of a tensor with one upper and one lower index, then you just write down the partial derivatives. And then for each upper index, you contract uh, with a Christoffel symbol. Um, with a plus sign, and for each lower index, uh, you contract with a Christoffel symbol with a minus sign. And the way that you remember uh, where the placement of indices goes is that the row index, that you're, the direction you're taking the derivative in, becomes an index of the Christoffel symbol. And then you just contract with either an upper or a lower index uh, in the tensor in the only way that you can, which is consistent with Einstein's summation notation. So the only thing you need to remember is that there's a plus sign when you have an upper index and a minus sign when you have a lower index. And with this definition, uh, the derivative operator is covariant and it obeys the usual product rule. And it has all sorts of wonderful properties. Uh, so for example, uh, the covariant derivative of the metric and its inverse is zero, which means that you can freely pass the metric through uh, the covariant derivative operator. And uh, this, uh, then, is our starting point for our uh, formulation of what it means for space-time to be uh, curved. So let's step back a second and ask, uh, what do we mean when we say that a geometry is curved. Well, there are lots of things that we could mean uh, intuitively when we say that a geometry is curved. Um, so he, let me now tell you uh, one thing that we could possibly mean we, when we say that a geometry is curved. So let's first imagine that we have a flat space. such as uh, the blackboard or a sheet of paper. Then you could imagine um, starting out with a vector at some point in this flat space. And then you could define some loop through this flat space, say a triangle. Could be any sort of loop. But let's take a triangle. And then you could imagine uh, dragging this vector along with you as you traverse um, this loop through space or through space-time. And as you tr traverse uh, this loop through space-time, you'll drag the arrow along with you. You'll drag the vector along with you. And in flat space-time, uh, what happens is that as you drag this vector along with you around this loop, when you get back to your starting point, the vector will uh, not have changed at all. So a vector which is transported around a loop uh, will come back to itself. But we can contrast this uh, with um, our favorite example of a curved space, namely that of a sphere. So as you know, 
the um, geodesics in a, uh, uh, a, a curved space time, well, the geodesics on a sphere are the arcs of great circles. So you could imagine, for example, having some sphere and looking at some triangle on the sphere. So here I'm trying to draw a triangle on the sphere. Um, here, let me move this down a little bit so that it's a little clearer. But the basic idea is that as you drag this arrow, this vector or this arrow on a triangle, um, on on a triangular loop through the sphere, then the vector will not come back to itself. So let's see that explicitly. So let's imagine that we start at this point over here with a vector that is parallel to the geodesic. So then when you transport that vector along the great circle, it will remain parallel to the geodesic. So it'll look like something like that. And then you can transport it back down to the equator. So it looks like that. And then by the time you get back to the original point, uh, the, the vector does not come back to itself but rather it com comes back to itself rotated by some angle. So here the vector does not come back to itself. So the notion of curvature that I wish to make precise is the notion that a spacetime is curved if a vector which is transported around a loop does not come back to itself. And uh, the, we say that a vector which changes by a large amount um, means that space-time is strongly curved, and a vector that changes by a small amount would mean that space-time is only weakly curved. Now, this is a notion of curvature that depends on a choice of loop <laughs> through space-time. Whereas what I'm really after is some sort of local notion of curvature that tells me if space-time is curved at any given point through space-time. So when I make this notion of curvature precise, what I'll really need to do is consider a very, very small loop around any given point in space-time. So now what I would like to do is make precise this notion of curvature as the failure of a vector to return to itself under um, transport around a loop in space-time. So, um, that is the uh, set of pictures that I want you to keep in your mind as we define our notion of curvature. Uh, before I go on to uh, introduce this notion of curvature uh, mathematically, uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Yes? Um, would there be instances where you could have a curve such that the vector actually does come back to itself even in the curve space? Absolutely. Okay. So, is it a rigorous rigor enough Well, um, as I've given you, as I've stated it so far, it's just a uh, idea. And I haven't told you yet how to make this notion um, completely rigorous. So, for example, uh, take a cylinder. If you think about it, a cylinder is something which you might regard as curved, but in fact, every vector will come back to itself under parallel transport. Sorry, I haven't defined what parallel transport is. Under the transport that I'm going to define and call parallel transport. Um, so... Uh, but intuitively, it's what you think of uh, with that notion. So um, there are, as you say, some sort of global uh, notions of curvature that will not be captured just by this notion that I'm going to present to you now. But we'll see that um, although, so I'm introducing this particular notion of curvature, uh, which will be called the Riemann curvature uh, in just a minute, but there are other notions of curvature which one could define. But there are uh, some special reasons why this is the correct notion to use in the formulation of general relativity, uh, which we will uh, come to um, this class or next class. Good question. Any other question? Okay. 
So the first thing that we have uh, to define is what is the notion of, uh, what is the precise notion of the transport of a vector along some curve through space time? So this is the following definition that I would like to give for the transport of a vector along a curve. So let's imagine that we have some world line x mu of lambda and some vector w mu. Then we will say that this vector w mu is parallelly transported around a curve or a world line x mu of lambda if the following condition holds. So let's define the tangent vector to the world line uh, just to be the derivative of x with respect to lambda. Let's call that v mu. And then we will say that this vector is parallelly transported if v mu grad mu of w nu is equal to zero. So why is this a correct uh, notion of parallel transport. Well, what do we mean when we say that a vector is being transported along the curve? What we really want to try and say is that vector doesn't change as we move along this path through spacetime. So uh, in words, what we want to say is that the derivative of the vector with respect to lambda, which is the parameter that labels different points along this world line, is equal to zero. And now, if we have scalars, then we have a nice notion of what it means to take the derivative with respect to lambda. You just take uh, d by d lambda, which by the chain rule is the same thing as v mu d mu. And then the question is, how do we generalize that notion of uh, the derivative with respect to lambda uh, when acting on vectors or tensors instead of just on scalars. The operator v mu d by dx mu is not a covariant operator. Uh, it's not an operator that you can act on vectors with and get another uh, vector. Uh, so we need to come up with some other notion of what it means to take the derivative with respect to lambda. And the only notion that makes sense, uh, namely the only notion that is tensorial, uh, or covariant and obeys the Leibniz rule will be uh, the use of this operator here, v mu grad mu. So this operator here is the directional derivative along the curve. Um, so this is the notion of what we mean for a vector to be parallelly transported along a curve. So, for example, a geodesic is a curve whose tangent vector uh, is not parallelly transported, um, but it's rather parallelly transported to, to itself along the curve. So let's put it this way. A geodesic is a curve whose tangent vector is for an affine parameter tra um, parallelly transported. Uh, just remember that phrased in terms of covariant derivatives, the geodesic equation is nothing more or less than the statement that v mu grad mu of v nu is equal to zero. Now, if you had a non-affine parameter, then you would have a term on the right-hand side of this equation proportional to v nu, which would be the statement that the tangent vector is not parallelly transported uh, per se, but rather it's transported to a multiple of itself. That will just reflect the fact that your parameter is not affine. Yes, there was a question. Uh, what does that mean? What does what mean? Uh, for an affine 
So remember that if you have an affine, so this is when we discuss geodesics, um, the geodesic equation in general said that the, uh, so remember, in general, if you have a lambda that labels points on your space time, um, the geodesic equation says that the covariant derivative of the vector along this world line is proportional to the vector. And if you have an affine parameter, then f of lambda is equal to zero. So this we covered uh, last class in the class before. Um, so um, for example, uh, remember that you can use uh, many different sorts. Of, so lambda is a continuous parameter that labels points on your world line. And you could use many different choices of parameter. One nice choice of parameter would be to label points on this world line by the uh, distance as measured on the world line from some reference point. Uh, that's some parameter that you could use. Uh, we call that an affine parameter. And it has the very nice property that the geodesic equation takes this form. So this is, when we discussed geodesics a couple mm -hmm. lectures ago, we spent some time discussing affine parameters. Um, and I believe that in order to do the problem set due tomorrow, you'll have to know and love affine parameters, if I remember correctly. Any other questions? Okay. So our notion of curvature is that a um, vector um, should come, so our notion of curvature says that whether or not spacetime is curved is determined by whether or not a vector will change when you transport it around a loop in spacetime. So we can then ask the following question. We can ask, how does a vector v mu change uh, when we parallelly transport, okay, those two lines are shorthand for parallel because I can't actually ever remember how many R's and L's and other letters uh, are in the word parallel. So how does this vector um, change under parallel transport around a small loop in space-time? So in particular, uh, let's imagine that we're starting at some point in space-time right here. And I wish to define my small loop just to be a small parallelogram where I have some vector. And so I uh, take some infinitesimal displacement of my vector and then another displacement and then I go back. So we could take uh, we could call this vector describing the infinitesimal displacement b mu and this vector a mu, and then we'll go back by applying the infinitesimal displacements minus b mu and minus a mu. So a mu and b mu will be vectors which describe uh, infinitesimal displacements And then we wish to ask how it is our vector will change under when we transport it around this very small par parallelogram. So for any given point in time, we specify two vectors, a mu and b mu. We use those to define a parallelogram that we transport this vector around. And then the deviation, the amount that this vector changes will give us some notion of the curvature of space-time at that point. So um, how do we make this precise? How do we use this to compute something? So so under this displacement where we say take the point x mu to x mu plus b mu, how does the vector change? Well, v mu will go to itself Plus, if b mu is a very, very small displacement, we could Taylor expand the vector at this new point in powers of b mu. And the first term in this expansion 
will just be the derivative of V with respect to lambda, where lambda is the parameter that labels points along uh, this curve. Uh, so namely, B alpha grad alpha of V mu plus higher terms. This is just a Taylor expansion in powers of lambda. So what does that mean when I transport this vector around this small parallelogram? So around the loop given by A mu and B mu, well, the change in the vector as we transport it around the loop well, the vector will go to itself, plus terms that are linear in A, which will cancel out because we have an A mu and a minus A mu, plus terms linear in B, which will also cancel out because we have a B mu and a minus B mu, then plus a quadratic term, which uh, will go like A mu B nu uh, times the commutator of the covariant derivative acting on V rho. Just because um, if you take the upper path along this uh, parallelogram uh, where you apply B mu and then A mu, then first you'll take a derivative uh, B mu grad mu, then a nu grad nu, whereas if you go the other direction, you'll apply the derivatives in the other order. So you can see that the change in the vector when you go around this parallelogram is nothing more or less than the commutator of two covariant derivatives. And remember that I told you that in flat space, the covariant derivative is the partial derivative. And by the equality of mixed partial derivatives then, in flat space, uh, the covariant derivatives commute, and this notion of curvature is equal to zero. That's exactly what we would expect. However, in general, in curved spacetime, covariant derivatives do not commute. And that is reflected by the fact that under parallel transport around a small loop, um, a vector does not come back to itself. And uh, the leading term uh, in the change of the vector is precisely the commutator of two covariant derivatives. So this then is a parameterization of uh, the local curvature of space-time at a given point. So um, what we'll do is we will define the curvature tensor um, which is, in fact, known as the Riemann curvature tensor. By the following equation. So, the change of a vector going around a small loop parameterized by the vectors A and B will be equal to um, some tensor with one upper and three lower indices times A mu, B nu, and V sigma, which according to the above argument is just the commutator of the two covariant derivatives acting on V. So R sigma mu, R rho sigma mu nu is a 1, 3 tensor, which captures the notion of the curvature of space-time at a given point. <clears throat> 
So because, of course, um, the Riemann tensor, the Riemann curvature tensor, will depend on where you are in space-time. If you're in a strongly curved region, it might be large. In a weakly curved region, it will not be large. And um, by the definition, you can see that the Riemann curvature tensor will be anti-symmetric in its last two indices, simply because uh, there's uh, a mu nu, which is given by a commutator. Now, um, the Riemann curvature tensor will also have lots of other wonderful properties that we will discover uh, this class and next class. So what I would like to do now um, is compute the Riemann curvature tensor for you. We have for explicit formulas for these covariant derivatives in terms of Christoffel symbols. And I've given you a definition of the Riemann curvature tensor. So for any vector v, r rho sigma mu nu, v sigma is equal to the covariant derivative grad mu grad nu v rho. So I would like to go ahead and use this formula to compute the Riemann curvature. Before I do so, let me pause and see if there are any questions. No questions? You sure? Last chance? Okay. Yes. So um, comparing these two equations, you can see that uh, a mu and b nu and v sigma are vectors. The covariant derivatives are vectors. So in order for the transformation properties of this formula here uh, to be tensorial, that requires that the Riemann curvature be a tensor. Now, um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to derive an explicit formula for the Riemann curvature, which if you wanted to, you could check um, uh, explicitly that what I write down will transform as a tensor. Um, that's a great exercise. Um, you know it's going to work out because I've defined the Riemann curvature in a tensorial way. Um, this is my definition here. Um, and so you know because the uh, right-hand side of this equation is a tensor, the left-hand side is going to be a tensor as well. Um, I'm going to write down at the end of the day a formula for the Riemann curvature, uh, in terms of the Christoffel symbol, looking at that formula, it won't at all be obvious that what I've written down is a tensor, but in fact, it will be a true statement. Good question. Yes? Uh, is there a Riemann curvature related to the Gauss curvature? Uh, the Riemann curvature is related to the Gauss curvature. I will not say more. Okay. okay. Um, yes. Uh, when we... Is it Yes. 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 So uh, the Riemann tensor has more information in it than the Gauss curvature. Um, when we get so, in fact, uh, certain components, certain traces of the Riemann tensor I, are completely equivalent to the Gauss curvature. So, okay. Let's. That's uh, an aside. Let's go ahead and compute the sky. So what is this? This is grad mu grad nu v rho uh, minus the same thing with mu and nu switched. Okay? Let's give ourselves plenty of room to work. So that first term, let's just use the definition of the covariant derivative. So this is d by dx mu grad nu v rho. Then there's a minus Christoffel symbol term, gamma uh, mu nu lambda grad lambda v rho uh, coming from the lower index of grad nu v rho. And then a positive Christoffel symbol term, gamma mu rho lambda grad, or here, Let's call this a different index just so that we don't get confused. Grad um, nu v sigma uh, minus the same thing with mu and nu switched. 
Now, the first thing that you can notice is that because the Christoffel symbol is symmetric in mu and nu, and we are subtracting off the same thing with mu and nu switched, that first term will be equal to zero. Uh, the second term, however, we will need to investigate a little more carefully. So let's continue expanding this out. So let's now expand out this guy. So what do we got? We've got grad mu, grad nu, v rho, plus grad mu, gamma nu rho, uh, sigma, v sigma, plus gamma rho mu sigma, now I'm looking at this term here, d nu v sigma, plus another Christoffel term, plus gamma rho mu sigma, gamma sigma nu lambda v lambda. Uh, minus the whole thing with mu and nu switched. Okay, again, this first term here is symmetric in mu and nu by the equality of mixed partial derivatives. So that's equal to zero. So all we need to do now is expand out this guy in the parentheses here. So what is that? Well, we have d mu gamma rho mu sigma v sigma plus gamma rho mu sigma d mu v sigma plus gamma rho uh, mu nu, sorry, mu sigma d nu v sigma plus this, ter this term quadratic in the Christoffel symbol gamma rho mu sigma gamma sigma nu lambda v lambda uh, then subtracting off everything the same thing with mu and nu switched. Now remember that at the end of the day we're going to get something that's supposedly proportional to v and indeed, if you look at the two terms that I've written in parentheses here, you'll see that when you switch mu and nu, those two terms will be interchanged. So the term in the parentheses there is symmetric in mu and nu. So when I subtract off the same thing with mu and nu switched, that will be equal to zero. So we are left with only two terms. So remember, this is R rho sigma mu nu v sigma. And this gives us a formula for the Riemann curvature tensor. So here, let me just, to make things a little clearer, change my labeling of indices here so that everything is proportional to v sigma. So R rho sigma mu nu is equal to grad the a, a term involving the derivative of the Christoffel symbol. And here I'm writing out explicitly uh, the subtracting off the thing with mu and nu interchanged. Plus a term involving the square of the Christoffel symbol. So this, then, is the measure of the curvature that we're after. So it's worth um, staring at this equation for a few minutes and just making a few comments. So remember that the Christoffel symbol gamma is not a tensor. And here we have defined the Riemann curvature and worked it out in terms of the Christoffel symbol. And it's some funny combination of the derivative of the Christoffel symbol and the Christoffel symbol squared. And so uh, it's not at all obvious from the equation that I wrote in the box that uh, this combination of the derivative of the Christoffel symbol and its squares uh, 
will transform as a tensor. But it does. There are two different ways to prove that. One way of proving it is just noting that uh, the definition that I gave for the Riemann tensor was a tensorial definition de defined only in terms of covariant derivatives, which are tensorial, namely covariant. Um, and hence, uh, it had to all work out to be a tensor. But the other way of proving it is just working out explicitly the transformation properties of this guy under coordinate transformations. Indeed, in some treatments of differential geometry, you will just see this boxed equation as the definition of the Riemann curvature, um, simply because it's the only thing involving the derivatives of the Christoffel symbol that you can write down that transforms in a covariant way. Now, I think that's a rather unintuitive definition of Riemann curvature, but it's a completely uh, logically equivalent one. The second thing that I would like to point out is that the Riemann curvature involves second derivatives of the metric. Remember, the Christoffel symbol involved first derivatives of the metric, so the Riemann tensor, which involves second derivatives of the, uh, which involves derivatives of the Christoffel symbol, will involve second derivatives of the metric. Now, in physics, all of our equations of motion are second order uh, differential equations. Newton's laws, uh, Maxwell's equations, those are all second order differential equations. So if the dyna dynamical variable of general relativity is the metric, then the equation of motion that we want to write down is, should be something that is A, uh, tensorial, and B, involves second derivatives of the metric. So it should not surprise you that, probably not this class, but maybe next class, uh, when I write down Einstein's equation, the equation of motion of general relativity, it will involve uh, the Riemann curvature. Yes, question. Could you come up with a fourth order using um, You mean something involving higher derivatives of... Uh, yeah, Absolutely. So, yes. So there are other uh, quantities that I could define that involve higher derivatives of the metric. Um, for reasons that we will see uh, maybe this class uh, or next class, in fact, all of those can be written as covariant derivatives of the Riemann tensor. So although it is not obvious from what I've written here, not only is um, uh, the Riemann tensor a way of packaging the derivatives of the metric, but the Riemann tensor is the only way of packaging all of the derivatives of the metric uh, in the sense that all of the uh, information in the derivatives of the metric can be packaged into the Riemann tensor and its covariant derivatives. We'll see that quite explicitly in a minute. That's a good question, though. Any other questions? Okay. So... Um, it's worth now, let me just um, tell you a few uh, facts about the Riemann tensor. Um, the first thing that I will do is give you a little bit of a definition. So, so far, um, I've used the word flat. I have said that space-time, Minkowski space is flat, <laughs> Euclidean space is flat. Flat, flat, flat. What does the word flat mean? What do I mean when I say that a space-time is flat? So let me now tell you exactly what I meant all of those times when I used the word flat. What I meant was that the Riemann tensor was equal to zero. So if the Riemann tensor of some space-time is equal to zero, we say that the space-time is flat. Now, that probably is not the definition that you had in your head when I was using the word flat earlier. But, in fact, um, let me just quote for you the following nice little fact. It's a fact that I won't prove to you, but it's a true fact. <coughs> 
which is that space-time is flat in the sense that I have defined it above, if and only if there is a coordinate system where the metric is constant. So, um, for example, um, we saw that you can write Minkowski space or Euclidean flat space in terms of a metric which is constant. So one could then go ahead and compute the Christoffel symbols. They'll be zero because they involve derivatives of the metric. And then you could compute the Riemann tensor. That'll be zero because the Christoffel symbols were zero. So um, Min flat Minkowski space, uh, flat Euclidean space are all flat in the notion that I have defined it above. But the truly interesting thing is that the Riemann tensor vanishing is all the information that you need in order to know that there's a coordinate system where the components of the metric are constant. So I could hand you some totally bizarre coordinate system, and I could ask you the question, is there a coordinate transformation which makes the metric constant? And now, you could spend all day and night playing around with funny coordinate transformations, and you may or may not be able to find one such that the metric in that coordinate system looks flat. But if you can compute the Riemann curvature and see that it's equal to zero, then you know that it's true that there's some coordinate system where the metric is flat. So this is another reason why the Riemann tensor is a good notion of curvature. If it vanishes, then the metric can be set equal to a constant. So if the Riemann tensor is equal to zero, then space-time is flat. So what that means is we should think of the uh, Riemann tensor then will tell us how it is that space-time deviates from being exactly flat. So let me tell you now a little bit more systematically exactly how it is that the Riemann tensor tells you that space-time is not exactly flat. Before I do so, uh, let me ask if there are any questions. Yes. Um, uh, given our, uh, uh, the Riemann tensor uh, uh, tells us that Right. right. So, um, that's an excellent question, um, and the answer is no. Um, let me. Well, I'm I'm sort of going to answer that question for you. I, there's a sense in which I'm going to answer this question for you uh, in just a minute. Um, I, it, I'm essentially I'm going to start answering this question for you in the next uh, discussion that I was going to do. Um, but let me just uh, uh, give you a, a, a little, uh, just say a few words about that. So um, remember that the Einstein equivalence principle, or the definition of a manifold, says that near any, in the region of any given point in space-time, you can choose a coordinate system where the metric is just the Minkowski metric. Now, the problem is that if you have two different points then the coordinate transformation, which makes the metric look Minkowski at one point, might not make the metric look Minkowski at a different point. And so um, uh, we need, and, but the point is that if the Riemann tensor vanishes, then in fact you can show that it's the same coordinate transformation at those two points. And so that's actually what we're going to discuss right now. Um, and then that would allow you to answer this question. But it doesn't give you any explicit help in constructing that coordinate transformation, if that's clear. I mean, so let's, let, let's consider this point in a little more, a little more detail. 
So remember that in the neighborhood, or remember, let me not use that phrase. Remember that for any point, say, x mu naught in space-time, it's possible to find coordinates, um, let's call them x mu hat, such that the metric is equal to the Minkowski metric at the point x naught mu in those coordinates. So we could then ask the question, how would we go about finding those coordinates? So how would we go about finding these x hat coordinates where the metric will be equal to the Minkowski metric at a given point? So let's just imagine that we were starting in some coordinate system uh, x mu coordinates with some metric g mu nu. And then we go to our new coordinate system I guess to be consistent, I might want to put the hat over the mu instead of over the x. Uh, that's just some notation. Okay, let's go ahead and put the hat over the mu. And in the new coordinate system, the metric in these coordinates is related to the metric in the original coordinates by the usual multiplication by two Jacobi uh, Jacobian matrices, and we wish to set this equal to eta mu nu. So, we then want to ask, is it possible to choose our coordinate transformation, our coordinates x mu hat, such that uh, this equation is satisf satisfied, and uh, g mu nu in these hatted coordinates is equal to the Minkowski metric. Well, let's just look at this equation for a second. So, we only need this equation to be true at x naught hat. So, let me just say, let's let our coordinate system, so if x mu naught is given by, is the point that I'm looking at. Let's let this be, uh, in the hatted coordinates, just the point where all of my coordinates are equal to zero. And then expand in powers of x naught mu hat. And then let's look at this equation that we have right here. So, at the point where x naught mu hat is equal to zero, um, let's look at this boxed equation right here. So then, we should view this as an equation for the Jacobian matrix, dx mu by dx mu hat. And how many degrees of freedom are there in the Jacobian matrix? Well, the Jacobian matrix, so I'm going to work only in four dimensions here to make my life simple. The Jacobian matrix is the set of four derivatives of four functions. So dx mu by dx mu hat has 16 degrees of freedom. Whereas the metric g mu nu at the point x naught has 10 degrees of freedom. So this is an equation for, uh, this is a set of 10 equations for 16 unknowns.
Uh, another way of saying that is that eta mu hat nu hat, the left and the right hand side of this equation is automatically symmetric in the mu hat and nu hat indices. So it's the number of equations, which is the number of components of a symmetric four by four matrix. So it's 10 equations. So this is 10 equations for 16 unknowns. Um, so it's going to be easy to solve. So it's solvable. And in particular, um, you could find the Jacobian matrix. Um, uh, you, you could find a Jacobian matrix, uh, which makes the boxed equation true. So that precisely is why uh, the Einstein equivalence principle is true for manifolds. Namely, there exists a coordinate system where the metric is equal to the flat Minkowski metric. Because we're solving 16 equations for the Jacobian matrix, sorry, 10 equations, uh, namely the equations for the metric components, in terms of 16 unknowns, which are the components of the Jacobian matrix. So um, I would like to now take this um, one step further. So let's ask not about exactly the point um, x hat equals to zero, but let's ask about points nearby. And so what I would like to imagine doing is Taylor expanding the equation eta mu hat nu hat equals to dx mu mu by dx mu hat dx nu by dx nu hat times g mu nu. And I would like to expand this equation order by order in the variable x mu hat. And then I would like to ask whether it's possible to sa solve this equation not only um, first order in at zeroth order in x hat, but at successively higher orders in x hat as well. Is the question clear? Because I'm about to go through uh, a rather um, gnarly little piece of uh, tensor manipulation. Um, so is the uh, question clear before I proceed to do the computation? The answer that we find, in fact, will be rather remarkable. So let's look at this boxed equation here. So the left-hand side is just a constant. It's a constant to all orders in x hat. So what we then need to do is imagine expanding the right-hand side of this equation out order by order in x hat and solving it at each order in that expansion. Um, so we then need to ask at each order in this expansion how many equations we have to solve and how many unknowns there are. So let's start by imagine, imagining expanding this uh, Jacobian matrix order by order in our uh, powers of x hat. So um, I'm going to, uh, so I'm, go well, yeah, for the sake of clarity, maybe I'll uh, not write out any indices here just because uh, they will quickly take over the computation. But let's just understand how this works. So let's imagine expanding this guy order by order in x hat around the point where x hat is equal to zero. So you start with the value of dx by dx hat at x hat equals to zero. So that has 16 degrees of freedom because there are four possible indices, four possible values for each one of those four indices. So we have four times four, which is 16 degrees of freedom. Then there's the term which is linear in x hat. 
So what is that? That's the set of second derivatives of x with respect to x hat evaluated at x hat equals to 0 uh, times x hat. So how many degrees of freedom are there in the first derivative of the Jacobian matrix? Well, there are four possible values for the x index. And then in the lower indices, there are four possible values for each of the x hat indices. But by the equality of mixed partial derivatives, um, we, they won't all be independent components of the second derivative <coughs> of the coordinate transformation. And the two lower indices will have the same number of degrees of freedom as that of a symmetric two index object or a symmetric four by four matrix, namely 10. So there'll be a total of 40 degrees of freedom. And then we could expand to the next order in um, x hat. So there'll be something involving the third derivative of x with respect to x hat evaluated at x hat equals to 0 times x hat squared. I'm dropping all of my indices here. And how many degrees of freedom are in this guy? Well, the number of degrees of freedom is 4 times the number of degrees of freedom in a symmetric three index object. So how many degrees of freedom are there in a symmetric three index object? Well, uh, let's first consider the case where all three of the indices are equal. So there are four possible choices when all of the indices are equal. Now let's consider the case where uh, two of the indices are equal. So then there are four indices for the first index, four choices for the first index, and three for uh, the next index. And then we can consider the case where all three of the indices are different. So there'll be four times three times two choices uh, in that case. But we have to divide by six because um, the... Uh, indices are symmetric, so you don't want to count 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2 um, independently. So there are six possible permutations of three indices. So adding it all together, we have 80 degrees of freedom. And then if we were particularly um, uh, powerful, we could then proceed to do this uh, to higher and higher order in x hat. So these are the number of degrees of freedom in the Jacobian matrix at each order in x hat. And what do we want to compare this to? What we want to do is then ask how many degrees of freedom are there in the metric. And we want to ask at each, at each order in x hat, whether there are a number, enough degrees of freedom in the metric, in the Jacobian matrix, that will allow us to get rid of all the degrees of freedom in the metric. So we could then imagine expanding the metric G um, in a power series in x hat. So at x hat equals to zero, there will be 10 degrees of freedom because the metric is a symmetric two index object. So it's a four by four matrix, which is symmetric, which has four uh, what is it, 4 times 5 over 2 um, possible uh, uh, degrees of freedom. Then the next term will be the set of first derivatives of the metric evaluated at x hat equals to 0 times x hat. So there will be how many degrees of freedom? Well, there'll be 4 for the derivative index along with 10 degrees of freedom, so a total of 40 degrees of freedom, 10 from the metric, 4 from the derivative. And then there'll be a term involving uh, the second derivative of the metric, evaluated at x hat squared. How many degrees of freedom will be there? Well, 
as above, the derivatives um, will be symmetric by the equality of mixed partials. So there'll be 10 degrees of freedom in the derivatives, the number of degrees of freedom in a symmetric two index object, and 10 degrees of freedom for the metric for a total of 100 degrees of freedom. So we can then imagine trying to solve the equation eta mu hat nu hat equals g mu nu dx mu by dx mu hat dx nu by dx nu hat order by order in x hat. And how will that proceed? Well, the first thing we need to consider is that equation at order x hat equals to zero. So at order x hat to the zero, we can use the 16 degrees of freedom in the first derivative of the Jaco in the Jacobian matrix um, to set the 10 degrees of freedom in the metric equal to uh, uh, eta. So we have 10 equations for 16 unknowns. Or another, let me say that a little better. We can use the 16 degrees of freedom in the Jacobian matrix to get rid of the 10 degrees of freedom in the metric. The metric has 10 degrees of freedom. The first derivative of a coordinate transformation has 16 degrees of freedom. We can use those 16 degrees of freedom to get rid of the 10 degrees of freedom in the metric. Now, here's the neat part. We can also do the same thing at first order in x. So remember that at first order in x, as we saw right here, there are 40 degrees of freedom in the first derivative of the Jacobian matrix. And there are 40 degrees of freedom in the first derivative of the metric. So we have 40 equations for 40 unknowns, and we can find a solution. So at first order in x hat, we can use the 40 degrees of freedom in dx by dx hat to set not only the derivative equal to the, um, so we can not only set the metric equal to eta mu nu, but we can set the derivative of the metric equals to zero. Is that clear? We can solve the boxed equation up above. We can solve, uh, sorry, we can solve this boxed equation to first order in x hat, which means we can find a coordinate system not only where the metric is Minkowski, but the derivative of the metric agrees with the derivative of the Minkowski metric, namely it's equal to zero. And then you could even try and work to one higher power in x hat. So at order x hat squared, however, there are, let's go and look here, there are 80 degrees of freedom in the Jacobian matrix, but there are 100 degrees of freedom in the second derivatives of the metric. So at order x hat squared, there are 20 degrees of freedom in the second derivative of the metric, which cannot be removed by a change of coordinates. So if you really w wish to do a proper accounting of the number of degrees of freedom in the metric, then you really shouldn't think uh, you really need to be careful because you can always choose a coordinate system where the metric and its first derivative are equal to the Minkowski metric. But it's only in the second derivative of the metric do you have 
information that can't be removed by a judicious choice of coordinates. So what you would really like is some tensorial packaging of all of the information in the second derivative of the metric. So there are 20 degrees of freedom in the second derivative of the metric, which can't be removed by a coordinate transformation. And as we will see shortly, uh, maybe by the end of class or early next class, the covariant way of packaging those 20 degrees of freedom is precisely the Riemann curvature tensor. Yes? As you move up, uh, kind of like and yes. Uh, how does the, uh, the uh, degrees of freedom, uh, is it linear? Or um, well, you just have to do the computation. Uh, it's not linear, right? So if you wanted to go one higher power in x, um, let's say if you wanted to look at this equation, at the next order in x, um, you would have the number of degrees of freedom in the a three index symmetric object from the derivatives, which what was that? Um, that was 20 uh, times the number of degrees of freedom in the metric, which is 10. So you would have 200 degrees of freedom uh, at the next order. And then up here, you would have, uh, let's see, four for the upper index times the number of degrees of freedom in a symmetric four index object. Uh, I don't remember how many degrees of freedom there are in a symmetric four index object, um, but the difference would be 80. So, um, and how did I do that computation? I did that computation because I knew that the Riemann tensor has, oh fuck, but I forgot about the uh, Bianchi identity. Okay, I take that back. You would have to do the computation. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Um, you, yeah, um, so uh, at the next order, x hat cubed, um, you would have one, you would have four times the number of degrees of freedom in a symmetric four index object. So you just have to do that computation. I don't remember how many degrees of freedom there are in a symmetric four index object. But the difference of those two would be the number of degrees of freedom in the first derivative of the Riemann tensor. Um, but the first derivative of the Riemann tensor, as we will see, actually obeys some non-trivial identity known as the Bianchi identity. So, you would need, so that matching will all work out, but I'm not going to do it explicitly. Okay, but let's, before, you know, before trying to do higher order matching, let's just finish our discussion of the matching uh, of these 20 degrees of freedom. So just to summarize... There are coordinates, so near our point, so, so for any point, x not mu, there are coordinates, we'll call them x mu hat, such that The metric is equal to the Minkowski metric at that point, and the first derivative of the metric is equal to zero at the point uh, x not mu. And uh, these coordinates are known as Riemann normal coordinates. So it's worth um, stepping back and thinking a little bit about the physical significance of Riemann normal coordinates. So the first thing that we should notice about Riemann normal coordinates is that in Riemann normal coordinates, I'll abbreviate RMC, the Christoffel symbol is equal to zero at the point x not mu. So what does that mean? We have found a coordinate system where the Christoffel symbols vanish. What are the Christoffel symbols? The Christoffel symbols are the correction terms that arise in the geodesic equation because you, either you are in the presence of gravity or you are in the presence of an accelerated coordinate system. <coughs> 
Let's remember Einstein's elevator. What is the point of Einstein's elevator? The point of Einstein's elevator is that in the neighborhood of any given point, according to the Einstein equivalence principle, um, if you only perform physics experiments in a very small neighborhood of that point, you will be unable to tell whether you are in uh, the presence of gravity or in the presence of an accelerated coordinate system. For example, you won't know if you're in an elevator subject to the force of gravity or if you're out in the middle of space and your elevator is being towed behind a constantly accelerating spaceship. So these coordinate, and then in that case, if you're, you can always choose an accelerated coordinate system where the motion looks inertial. So these coordinates are the locally inertial coordinates Uh, of Einstein's elevator. Uh, in other words, they are coordinates where there are no fictitious forces. At the point x not mu. So you can always choose a coordinate system where the Christoffel symbols vanish and there are no uh, fictitious forces um, at that point. However, um, we have only been able to set the first derivative of the metric equal to zero. We have not been able to set the second derivative of the metric equals to zero. And the information in the second derivative of the metric will appear in the Riemann tensor. Um, so, what I would now like to do is write out the Riemann tensor in these Riemann normal coordinates to see what it looks like. And doing that, we will be able to understand um, in a bit more detail the various symmetry properties of the Riemann tensor and count the number of degrees of freedom, for example, of the Riemann tensor, and see that it agrees with the 20 degrees of freedom that we saw um, are the number of degrees of freedom in the second derivative of the metric that cannot be removed by judicious choice of coordinate transformation. But we're just about at the end of class, and I think this is a computation that deserves more than the uh, one minute that we have left. So maybe I'll just stop here and see if there are any questions. So this counting of the number of degrees of freedom and the fact that one can always go to a Riemann normal coordinates, uh, which are locally inertial, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a subtle uh, argument. So um, if this wasn't entirely clear, I encourage you to go over it again uh, on your own. All right. See you Wednesday. So, oh, sorry. Did you have a question? Um, my office hours are Thursday, 3 to 4. Um, oh, the, the TA's office hours are Friday afternoons. Uh, if you have any specific questions, you can ask right now. Here, why don't I stop the recording um, and let uh, people go.